from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. And coming up today, K-State's Dan O'Brien will comment on the USDA's crop acreage report released on Tuesday, how those new numbers will likely be supportive of corn and soybean prices for some time to come. Also, K-State's A.J. Sharda will have a look at how radically field sprayer boom height can change as the spray rig crosses a field, significantly affecting product placement. He has new research findings on that. Today's Kansas Wheat Harvest Report features Tony Whitehair of Dickinson County and Stacy Campbell of the Cottonwood Extension District. And on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Dennis Patton on midsummer management of garden tomatoes. That's what's ahead on this Agriculture Today. Man, it's hot out here. Heat stress affects more than just humans. It also affects livestock. Extreme heat, humidity, wind speeds, and cloud cover all make a difference in air temperature. To control problems, make sure your livestock have shade and water provided at all times. This will help prevent problems in breeding, meat production, and reduce chances of death. Please take all these into consideration for livestock production. Brought to you by K-State Animal Science Leadership Academy participants. Welcome once again to Agriculture Today, coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University. Well, the grain markets... Uh, have a little more spring in their step this week, thanks to the new USDA crop acreage report, which came out on Tuesday. And we'll dissect that and get into what's going to happen with the markets from here with Dan O'Brien, grain market economist, K-State Research and Extension. Dan, along with us a day earlier than normal, in that we will be away tomorrow for the extended Independence Day weekend. What a shot in the arm for the markets, Dan, and sort of out of the blue, particularly when you consider that corn number. Folks wondering, where did the acreage go? Well, where did the seed sales go? Uh, <laughs> you know, honestly, when you think back in past years when we've had issues like this, we're hearing rumors of this and challenges of that in terms of seed not going out and things not coming in. And we heard none of that. There were some early early uh, surveys done uh well, actually, in the midst of COVID-19, first impacts, especially with the ethanol industry, suffered so badly. We were wondering, gosh, we're going to drop to to what, 92 million acres or something? Mm-hmm. And here now, this report came in and pre-report expectations were, I think they were for 94 or something like that on the low side. And then this this 92 came in. And, and really, the the challenge of this is that, again, this survey was based on on early June stuff. It says 92.066 million acres. The USDA says right right on that acreage report that they're still anticipating 2.2 million acres to be planted beyond that to get up to the 92. So what they actually had in hand by the time they measured that was was about 89 and a half to 90 million acres, which is, you know, wow. And the soybean number is not incomprehensible because, again, you can plant soybeans later, but just amazing (laughs) number (laughs) projecting 83.8 million acres planted and saying uh, as of June one, that there were 12.1 of those that still weren't in the ground. So, you know, this is a big deal. We we've had some sizable rains since then. In some of those areas, it's spotty, but uh, interesting. And again, we were running right up into crop insurance report dates and all. And I think this is a Northern U S story primarily in North Dakota. Some of those areas where some of where they had problems carried over from last year. And, and maybe, maybe that's the, maybe that's the story behind all this in that we had such problems from last year, delayed harvest, et cetera, wet, soggy fields up in there. And what we did hear of this was that, uh, gosh, people just, it was taking a while to get the old crop out and get the new one going. And uh, we have in the re- report info, the USDA did, and we reproduced it in, in our weekly notes, uh, the uh, planted acreage numbers by different states. And again, you see in particularly North Dakota where these issues had come up. One has to earnestly wonder, though, Dan, on both counts, but particularly with corn, what the odds are of attaining that extra 2 million acres and uh, 12 million acres for soybeans. Well, you would have to wonder whether they'll get to all of that. But 
we don't want to put ourselves in the position of betting against the ingenuity and drive and motivation of us farmers, right. but in some of those areas, it's pretty wet. And, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they end up with that or less, you know, I would think for both those crops, I wonder now where with the upcoming July WASDE report, the WASDE report is going to take these acres as given. These acres will hold on to, unless there's really a surprise, all the way to, I think, either the August or September crop report. Wouldn't be surprised if it's the September, but USDA will decide. But, you know, so here we're in July, probably through August, maybe into September, 60 days, 65, 70 days, uh, that we'll, we'll have a perspective based on these planted acres and uh, if it does come in short we we won't have a verification on that until september so it just it's, it sets us up for volatility and it's just so amazing eric again as we were in in may oh the sky is falling we'll never get out of this in one fell swoop and a surprise apparently to the whole market that man acres are really short or likely to be short and still at risk you know so where do these balance sheets go the usda hasn't but they came out in that june supply demand balance sheet projection and they were looking at 97 million acres and now we're at 92 and hoping we got that at 178 bushels an acre and at, in most cases nobody's really negative on yields although i heard i've been hearing what mary knapp has talked about in terms of warm nighttime temperatures and that's worrisome i think anyway so instead of this 16 billion bushel crop is it 14 to 14 and a half and uh uh, we already were planning on usage to be rationed some because of ethanol and whatever else and feed use. But what seems to be off the table, unless I'm really surprised, is instead of, of us having a 3.3 billion bushel carryout, we're probably back at least down to two. The last time we were around 2 billion bushel carryout, we had uh, the season average corn price well back in 2018, 19, 19, 20 at 360. And the last projection USDA had was 320. Interesting. Deese corn, you look at where it closed on uh, on Wednesday, 360. So that's that seems to be the conservative view of where we're at. And and with lower acres, if we have any weather issues, uh, again, we were pretty dry wondering where this thing was going up until those rains came from Cristobal and whatever else. Well, if it turns dry and we uh, get 175 or 170 bushels per acre, then 13 and a half to 14 billion bushel of production carry out uh, certainly below two, probably closer to 1.5. And that's a, that's a very volatile market at higher prices than what we're looking at right now. If I can, we, I think we should talk about soybeans. By all that, means, yes. So- Have to look at the soybeans, not only from that acreage perspective that you mentioned earlier, but the uh, stocks numbers, maybe the enthusiasm there isn't nearly as robust as it is in corn, but nonetheless, there are favorable signals here, are there not? We're up down sideways on what could happen, but the USDA in, the, in that June WASDE report projected 83.5 million acres that came in here at 83.8, et cetera, but 12 million of that haven't been planted. So really that the surprise could be, a, it would be in how many of the 12 million that weren't planted on June 1 are going to get planted. If half of that doesn't get planted, well, that's a big deal. Huge <laughs> and deal, right. So we're opening up the risk of, uh, instead of that, just under 400 million bushel carryout that the USDA has projected, and it was 900 million two years ago, just under six last year. Well, now we're at four, hoping we get there. Uh, any type of weather risk, you know, if you get down to 300 million or back to the old glory days price wise of 200 million or less, then that's, that's just a different world than where we're at. What, what we're set up for is to be kind of insulated from, I think, more likelihood of being insulated from US China trade issues uh, because even if the Chinese go completely elsewhere to go buy beans, they run up the price on Brazilian soybeans. In that trade, we come back, we've been down about 20% or so, plus or minus. Well, even with that, if we have lower supplies, then uh, then you're able to, to buffer U.S.-China trade impacts you know, through that balance sheet more readily. So, uh, you know, I don't want to go all the way from being a complete bear to all to a complete bull on the thing, but but with these numbers, you've changed the underlying oversupply assumptions of the market to now where we have to consider, well, two things have happened. One, 
GSA will be judicious in its July WASDE report numbers and, and they'll up some things. So that's going to have to happen, no doubt. But the other thing will be that that now as you, as you change these expectations down and uh, prospects for carryouts are not near as good as they were, particularly in corn, uh, the market's going to be more reactive. So from here till we know what we have, instead of having a docile June heading into July without much excitement, and, and in some years when we have a big crop, we just slide, tend to slide all the way into harvest. That thing seems off the table right now, <laughs> you know, because we we don't have the planted acres to sustain, especially for corn, to sustain that oversupply scenario right now. So likelihood of a lot more uh, volatility than we thought we'd be having just from one report. And we'd be remiss, Dan, in closing, if we didn't talk of the wheat trade in that we're heading into the roughly the latter third, to put it that way, of the harvest here in Kansas and what we see in the way of prices and where we might be going. What's your read right now? We were at 420 uh, about two days ago. We were closed at 442 on Wednesday, July 1st, and uh, we're in the midst of of harvest in Kansas. So you gain 20 cents, uh, 20 cent gift to anybody that has to sell. And basis levels, uh, eastern uh, half of the state, we're in harvest. We've got 10 under, 7 under basis levels. So that's something. Out to the west, again, harvest coming on and 30, 40 cents under, 25 in some locations. That's not indicating a washout in terms of demand for the for the crop and uh It'd be interesting to see what it portends, what it aims us towards once the combines are are through, and and then we have to start managing supply and figure out where we go from there. Well, much more enthusing overtones to the markets than we've talked of in quite some time collectively, Dan. And, of course, have a look at his notes on all of this on the agmanager.info website. Many thanks to you, and we will talk again next week. Thanks, Eric. Take care. Dan O'Brien, Grain Market Economist, K-State Research and Extension, along with us from his office in Colby, Northwest Kansas. We'll return with more after this. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Kansas farmers and ranchers are helping feed your family in the world. The largest contributor to the Kansas economy is beef cattle. How do you get that juicy steak on your plate? In order for you to enjoy your tasting meal, it requires the hard work of the producers, marketers, advertisers, processors, inspectors, transporters, packers, and consumers. So thank all these people and sit back, relax, and enjoy your tasty meal. Agriculture Today continues now. Over these next few moments, the latest developments in K-State Laboratories on sprayer technology. And our guest is working on several concepts that will be of interest to you producers. And we'll talk about those in a moment. But first, as we visit with K-State Precision Agricultural Engineer A.J. Sharda, we want to congratulate you, A.J., for recognition that just came down a couple of days ago by something called the Precision Ag Alliance and it recognized you as a leader in education and research in this field. So congratulations on that. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. We'll talk about the award. What goes into this and what it signifies? Well, this uh, award is, uh, uh, is, like you said, is run by Precision Ag Alliance. It's uh, one of the frontier platforms where a lot of uh, most innovative, most informative knowledge is available uh, from industry in terms of precision ag products, vision of different uh, people from academics and industry and how things are moving forward uh, in this uh, in this arena. I'm really honored to be in, you know, a lot of my peers have gotten this award is that they're, they're looking for people who are really bringing change in terms of both education and research towards precision ag I feel really good for biological and agricultural engineering at K-State, but also for K-State as a whole that we are doing okay. I think we need to do a lot more and keep bringing more and more collaboration and, and research projects and keep training people. 
Well, you are all about all of that, and so richly deserved recognition again, the Precision Ag Alliance declaring A.J. the national award winner in education and research. Now to our primary topic at hand, and among the many things that you are researching ongoing would be sprayer operations and looking at boom height and maintaining consistency in boom height for more accurate applications. So give us the overview of your current work, if you would. Yes, uh, I, we have been doing some work uh, all along uh, my time here at K-State, but recently we've picked up uh, a lot more projects. Uh, and one of our biggest focus is to really understand uh, the different facets of technology which can impact the product delivery and product deposition. So these are the two main components we are focusing on. Now, there are a lot of uh, advancements which have been made in terms of product delivery, but we are trying to focus more and more in terms of product deposition. And when we talk about product deposition, two things which are very, very critical is the, the stability of the boom height from the target, which is our crop, and then, uh, obviously, the environmental conditions, you know, both wind speed and temperature and all that, uh, which can really impact the amount and the quality of the product which will be, you know, getting deposited on the canopy. Amount means, you know, how much, you know, how much actual volume really gets deposited on that, right? Both from a coverage standpoint and you know, the droplet size distribution standpoint, but from the perspective of quality, you know, we really want those droplets to maintain their size and the kind of droplet distribution. To and when we address that stability, you point out that as a sprayer crosses a field, even if the terrain is somewhat consistent, that boom action can really vary to the point of off-target applications. Absolutely spot on. So our goal was that we really wanted to create uh, our gather information from a typical farm, right? We are really fortunate. I think I've, I've talked about it before as well. We have great collaborators in form of producers. So we get to pick really selective fields. Like we have fields which are 120, 130, 40-acre field, nice terrain, good irregular field. We have fields which have terraces, which we have fields with a lot of, uh, lot of tight turns. Last year and this year, we have been running these tests on large self-propelled sprayers, uh, pretty much everything which is 120 foot wide. For all these projects, we are intentionally hiring a commercial applicator out of uh, a co-op so that we are driving the sprayer in a manner in which a commercial applicator would apply this field, looking at the shape, the terrain, and all the regular. We explain to him in terms of what needs to be done in terms of target application rate and pressure, but then we let him do, we ask him that you drive it the way you would have driven it to finish your task. It's real life, in other words. It's real life done in a manner which is representative of a real life situation. So we had some field which had lots of terraces and terrain to it, but we have some fields which are very nice, smoother terrain and nice long passes. And, uh, from both years of observations, we we are we are learning that there is a lot more movement happening than anyone will expect. We are learning that a lot more movement is happening. And now people people have to understand that, and we are trying to add more information on it. That the particle, when it it is released from the tip of the nozzle, it has the ability to go certain distance you know, based on the speed it has leaving the nozzle tip. When the boom movement happens, you are really increasing the height of the boom if it is going up, um, making it more and more prone to get volatilized or being carried away by the wind. Wind are two factors. One is a natural wind, which is blowing. And two, the wind current, which are being generated by the movement of the machine itself, Hmm. right? Right. So that's one thing. And then same thing when we are going down, we are creating a different type of uh, impact. But in both the cases, I am significantly changing the amount of overlap and how much the product uniformity is 
across the, the swath of the, the boom itself. Now, one more thing we have to understand is when the boom goes up, we don't go up and down horizontally. You know, the boom goes up at a certain angle. Right. And if the boom moment is too much, then I'm spraying actually product away from my target into the current of the wind. All right. So those were some really, really fascinating in pieces of information uh, uh, which we are gathering. We were also trying to measure what do we experience in terms of wind speed. And from a commercial applicator standpoint, the operator was saying that I have to log what the wind speed, wind direction was using my gadget. And from an end user perspective, they were saying that really helps me to make a decision. Should I go out to spray or not? So another very important thing is that, so when we go, when we are applying in a certain day, you know, yes, granted the wind direction can change, right? But there will be a time and for a good bit of time, we have one wind direction, you know, in which the wind is blowing. But we go back and forth. Mm-hmm. We are doing east, west, north, south, or any combination of it. And going into the wind or against the wind or going across the wind, all these three situations are going to have a very different type of product deposition on the category. I think that's another very fascinating piece uh, to learn how should we drive me? You know, should I always be driving in crosswinds or along the wind or against the wind? What can I do? What impact does it have in terms of you know, volatility and, and deposition? So your task here is to quantify all of this, AJ. So either operational modifications can be made or potentially somewhere down the line, actual structural changes could be made to the sprayer itself? Absolutely. Absolutely. We, yeah. Everything is with a with a very clear goal and motive in front. So this is a, is a very small piece of a, a much bigger puzzle. Uh, and we are only talking about one aspect of the whole research but I think this is a very important aspect of the spray application component and what we need to be talking about. I think people understand the end users, but I think when we're going to show them these spatial maps, which are very high spatial density maps, and we have mapped all the sensors on the boom simultaneously. It's not a point map. It's like wherever my sensor is, I have GPS location and passes of that. People can really see by themselves, and I think it would be a point of reckoning that how much of the boom movement can happen, Mm -hmm. and then we need to do something about it, whether it is driving style, whether it is asking for modifications, whether it is asking for recommendations, whatever it is. But I think they will be in a position to ask questions and make modifications. It's about awareness, though, at this point, as to right. the extent and the extreme variation in boom height. So, Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. This will be interesting information as you continue to uncover it, AJ, among many other projects you have going on at this time. But this is a special consideration now as, again, uh, sprayer operations are very much well underway across the state of Kansas. Thank you for telling us about this work and keep it up as well as everything else you have on your plate. And and once more, congratulations on that award from the Precision Ag Alliance. We appreciate your time. Appreciate it. Along with this Precision Agricultural Engineer, A.J. Sharda of K-State Research and Extension. We'll be back with more after this break. You are listening to Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. 
We're back now on Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you and once more with another update on wheat harvest progress in Kansas. We've been turning to Extension Agricultural agents from around the state to supply information from their counties and districts. We'll begin today with a look at how far harvest progress has gotten along in Dickinson County toward the north central part of the state. Talking now with Extension Agricultural Agent Tony Whitehair. So, Tony, how have things moved along in Dickinson County? You've had some open weather in recent days. We have. Uh, progress has been uh, pretty well here the last uh, week. Uh, last week we had some cooler temperatures in the in the mornings with uh, a few of those actually having a little bit of dew and a couple of rain showers that slowed things down. Um, but since about last uh, Thursday, uh, it's been going uh, 100% as fast as they can, as long as the elevators stay open for them. Uh, weather has been pretty favorable. We've been uh, hot, we've been windy, and um, the wheat's just flowing through the combines right now. So as we talk at this moment, roughly how far along is the harvest in percentage terms? Um, I'd say we're probably in the neighborhood of 60 to 70 percent done. They've been, been running pretty hard, and uh, there's a, a lot of uh, open wheat fields now. So in general terms, what have yields and test weights been like to this point? You know, I'd say we've probably been average to above average. You know, we've had some some really good yields here across the last, you know, five to seven years in the area. Some of those fields might be a little bit lower than what they've seen across that time period, but still be considered above average, you know, for their long-term yield history. Test weights have been pretty good. I've heard of a few spots in fields that were pretty low, um, a couple loads that came off of one uh, one area had some test weights in the in the low 50s, and I think some of that was actually attributed to uh, some late season head scabs that came in. So you take those fields out, and we've been in that you know 56 to 60 uh, pounds uh, test weight. Um, so that's been pretty positive. Haven't heard a whole lot on protein. We did do some protein samples from one of our wheat plots, and had just got those. Um, back this week was a little bit lower than what we kind of would have liked from some of those varieties. But, you know, we still were in that 12 to 13, 14 percent protein range. But when you say average yields in Dickinson County, what's the ballpark figure then that you'd normally expect? You know, for our our upland terrace, we're going to be in that 45 to 60 bushel range, depending on um, the quality of the soil that's in that, plus, you know, what your rotation is. Some of our river bottom and, and creek bottom, we'd expect a little bit better. Some of the combines I've been on here in the last week, uh, there was an upland field. Second or third year in wheat was right around 52. Test weight on that was about 58 and a half to 59. Then there was some, some river bottom uh, that was after soybeans. I probably wouldn't give it much yield on it back in February when it was being top dressed, um, but they ended up making right around 66. There was no fungicides put on that. So, you know, I think guys were were hoping for a little bit better. We went into last fall with some pretty good moisture in the subsoil, but we kind of had a dry winter at times and uh, it dried up really quick um, late this spring and and going into June, um, we got hot and dry. And I think, uh, you know, maybe had a little bit of top end taken off by some of that weather. Well, Tony, thanks for the summary of harvest progress in Dickinson County. Appreciate it. Yep, you're welcome. That's Tony Whitehair. Tony is the Extension Agricultural Agent in Dickinson County. Now it's on further west in the state and on down I-70 toward the Ellis and uh, Barton County areas. Those two counties make up the Cottonwood Extension District. We're talking now with Extension Agricultural Agent there, Stacy Campbell. Stacy, let's just get folks up to the moment on how far harvest has progressed in those two counties. Yeah, Eric, harvest is progressing pretty well. Got a little bit of a slow start. I think we kind of got started and then had some rain that knocked everybody out of the field for several days. But, of course, with the hot, windy weather we've been experiencing lately, things are moving along pretty nicely. I'd say Ellis County is probably around that 70 to 80 percent done. 
And Barton County would be about in the same situation. They're 70 to 85 percent done. I think there will be quite a few probably finished by the end of the weekend if the weather holds out. So that will give you a pretty decent handle on how this uh, harvest is producing this year. What's the take on that to the moment? How are the yields coming out? How are the test weights? So, you know, as I asked people that, um, one elevator person said, well, nobody's talking. I haven't heard. <laughs> and another guy said, well, you know, there's. I'm not hearing. A, he said, when yields are pretty good, you know, they're kind of bragging some. And he said, I'm not hearing that this year. But I'd say there's a lot of 30 to 50 bushel, you know, wheat in both Ellis and Barton County. Quite honestly, probably a little above average, maybe, or at least average on our yields. So overall, considering the freeze that we've got in April and that we were needing moisture and it finally did come, but a little late, if you will, uh, I think some people are, you know, fairly pleased with, with the overall yields. Presumably the test weights are holding up on average then. Yeah, the the test weights, Eric, seem to be pretty good. I mean, probably I'd say in both counties around that 59 to 60 would probably peg the average test weight in both Ellis and Barton counties. Yeah. So, Stacy, since folks are being (laughs) tight-lipped about the yield specifically, any, any read on protein contents whatsoever? Yeah, I've been getting some reports on protein. Um, I have heard that there's some some wheat that's a little higher in protein, um, but I would say on on average, a lot of it is in the eleven in the elevens as far as protein. So, Stacy, just broadly speaking here, how important was it for your wheat producers out there to take in at least a decent crop? It wasn't spectacular, but yeah, yeah, important. You know, fifty bushel wheat at four dollars a bushel, which is Two hundred dollars an acre, and by looking at the budgets, you'd have to be a really, really efficient operator to be making any money or breaking even. You know, most mm-hmm. of the wheat I think around here it's taken over two hundred dollars an acre to produce it. So we've been fortunate to have some really good yields this year on the wheat. Not as good as probably the last two years, but still it's coming in better than expected. So that does maybe slow down the bleeding, if you will. Yeah. Thank you for giving us a quick portrayal of harvest progress out that way. Appreciate it, Stacy. Yes, thank you for having me, Eric. Stacy Campbell is an extension agricultural agent working in that Cottonwood Extension District, which is made up of, again, Ellis and Barton counties. And that's today's wheat harvest update for you. You are tuned to Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so stay a minimum of six feet away from others and stay home if you can. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. We're back now on Agriculture Today, and for you, our weekly horticulture segment, we are full bore into the tomato gardening season here in Kansas. So it's timely that we talk tomato management and harvest. Dennis Patton has joined us. Dennis is the Johnson County Extension Horticultural Agent. Of course, Dennis, tomatoes are one of our very favorite, if not favorite, vegetable out there among our home gardeners. This is getting into crunch time as far as succeeding with that tomato crop, isn't it? You know, that's right. Tomatoes are by far the most popular vegetable crop. Even people grow tomatoes and don't call themselves vegetable gardeners uh, because, you know, a lot of vegetables, produce, we can get fresh year round. But that elusive tomato is still the one that you cannot replace in the store. It has to be that kind of homegrown, vine ripe tomatoes. And so as we move into summer, the heat in in Kansas, That's when our tomatoes uh, either start producing or we start having disappointment. Let's talk about avoiding those disappointments today, if we might. (laughs) And you mentioned the heat of summer and the impact that hot, hot temperatures can have on, well, fruit set, for one thing. Speak to that, if you want. Right, right. Well, tomatoes, even though they're a, a summer crop, for them to set fruit, they're fairly finicky. Uh, If you have nighttime temperatures above 75 degrees, which we've had that in parts of Kansas already, that causes fruit set to decrease. On the other hand, you have temperatures above 95 degrees during the day with hot, dry winds. That causes the pollen to dry out, so it never reaches the flower of the tomato. 
and the fruit don't set on, especially on our nice, large slicing tomatoes, which of course that's what everyone wants for that, you know, classic summer BLT sandwich. And, and so our tomatoes have had a difficult time getting going. And now with the high heat, much Kansas is experiencing, we're having problems with fruit set. So is there anything that a gardener can do about that other than wait it out? You know, uh, well, <laughs> cherry tomatoes tend to be a little bit more forgiving. They're a little easier to set on. But of course, you know, personally, I do not like to go out and pick cherry tomatoes because it's an endless job. And, you know, I want that slicing tomato. So cherries tend to be a little more forgiving. But is there anything you do? Yeah, I, I think with anything when it comes to gardening, it's back to that good culture, good care. So, you know, proper fertilization, even moisture, mulching to keep the soil cooler. Uh, and then, of course, we have to watch out for some potential pest problems, whether it be insect or disease. You brought up watering and the fact that those roots may not be fully developed. So does one need to be somewhat delicate with their waterings here, not over water? You know, watering is in the horticulture world, helping someone learn how to water is the most difficult thing because we can't see what's going on down below ground. You know, the old adage of one inch of water per week is even moisture, which is ideal. My favorite way to water is just flood the ground at the base of the plant. Uh, as we get into diseases here in a second, that moisture on the leaf creates more disease pressure. So what I'll do on my own tomatoes at home is I'll just turn the hose on a slow trickle, kind of think five, 10 minutes, walk away, do something else in the garden, come back, move it to another plant and do that maybe once a week. And here again, that mulching, whether it be straw, grass clippings, leaves, whatever you have available, uh, helps cool that soil, conserve that moisture. So what we like is that even moisture because that helps those plants set better, grow better. Uh, we also we do some of that fruit cracking that we sometimes see uh, as we get ready to harvest a plant uh, by keeping that evenly moisture. So the guide's one inch a week. The other guide is dig down. If the soil's moist, don't water. If it's dry, water. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Yeah, it's as simple as that. Now to the challenge of disease control in tomato crops. This is something that is pressing, it seems, every summer, Dennis, because tomatoes are vulnerable to a, a host of things, actually. Are they not? Correct. Correct. And our office has already seen a lot of the foliar leaf disease called septoria leaf spot. Uh, it starts low on the plants. It looks like someone's put black pepper dots all over the leaves and they turn yellow. And then as the season progresses, it just moves up the plant and defoliates it. And so less foliage, less energy, less fruit. A um, couple ways to help prevent uh, septoria leaf spot. We've already talked about the importance of mulching. That keeps the spores from splashing up onto the leaf. Uh, another practice that's being recommended more and more is to remove the lower foliage. As that plant grows, to take the foliage off to what they call the first hand or the first cluster of fruit. And the theory here is that it's higher for those spores to splash up to those lower leaves. And so we never get it on the plant to work its way up. Once it's on the plant, it, it's there pretty much for the rest of the season. And of course, caging, staking, get that foliage up off the ground, air movement works, and then also watering, kind of keep that foliage dry. If you're going to water overhead, do it in the morning, afternoon, not in the evening, so we're going to have long dry periods. And if that all fails, which a lot of times it does, then you're back to a fungicide spray treatment to help keep it in check. And if one does end up committing to a fungicide regimen, that has to be continued on throughout the bulk of the growing season? Usually, you know, it's one of those things kind of play by ear. But if your plant's being infected, it, it, you got to stay ahead of it, you know. And, and chlorothalonol is the fungicide most people use, uh, readily available at most uh, garden centers. Uh, and then that's sprayed on an every couple week basis throughout the season. Also, I would continue to remove those really infected leaves, too, even though it's higher, because here again, you're decreasing the amount of spores. Also, that decreases the chance of those leaves falling to the ground, infecting your plants again next season also. I know on Facebook, I've already got some people posting pictures of blossom end rot, which is where the bottom end of the tomato rots off because of uneven moisture temperatures, those type of things. And the plant grows out of that. But the other thing that's going to happen is, you know, if we continue with these 95 degree days, which most of Kansas experience, even some are going up to the hundreds, is those fruit are not going to ripen properly. Uh, the, the color pigments don't develop under high temperatures. They either go more orange. So uh, the other thing that happens in urban areas is squirrels love to come in and get the tomato fruit once they get a blush of red. Once you get what they call a blush to the fruit, 
you can go ahead and pick it because pretty much all the sugar compounds, flavor compounds have entered into the fruit and you're just letting them go ahead and develop uh, and get that vine ripe taste. And a lot of times if you want a more of a red tomato versus an orange tomato during the heat of summer, picking them earlier than ripening them indoors on the counter, whether it's in the dark, whether it's in the light, it really doesn't matter to the tomato. That's kind of old wives tale will help and you'll still get a tasty fruit. Well, tomatoes, as with many of our other vegetables, do require consistent attention and no more so than this time of the season. As we get closer to actual harvest time, we appreciate the tips, Dennis, on getting to that finish line with our tomato crops. I'm waiting for my first one. I've got the bacon in the refrigerator. (laughs) All I need is that tomato now. (laughs) Well, best of luck with that. Thanks for your time, as always. You're welcome. He's Dennis Patton. Johnson County Extension Horticulture Agent on this week's Horticulture segment. Our time's away for today. Thanks for listening in. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.